the Lord. I am happy that I can be in the presence of the Lord, that I can be in the presence of his church family. And it's so good to see several who have been missing out on being physically present uh, in the building. Uh, we've been praying for them. We'll continue to do that. But we've got several prayer requests that have come in this morning, as well as our standing requests. You'll see go up behind me. Uh, we've got a half sheet in the back. Uh, we'll be updating that here this week uh, with corporate prayer on Tuesday. Uh, but we want to remember Brother Rodney Edmond, as well as uh, Brother Ken and Sister Vicki Gastineau, uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, so want to continue to remember them, strengthen them. Sister Leslie Mahler, uh, also want to continue to remember Brother Don Predmore, home from surgery, recovering. Uh, Sister Amy Vishwanatha, uh, as well as uh, Sister Joanne Post has surgery this week as well. Want to remember her. Uh, also want to remember Brother Aaron Messina. Uh, this will be his last Sunday. He's going to go and uh, help Powerline Ministries in the mall. So we want to send him uh, with a blessing. So remember him. Uh, also, Sister Kathy Predmore's uh, brother Warren and co-worker Tammy both came through surgery and are on the mend. And uh, it is good to see someone we've been praying for for a long time. Still got a ways to go, but Brother White is here, doing better. If you have a prayer request that wasn't mentioned, raise your hand. If you'd like to be anointed with oil, we're going to open up the altar for prayer. We've got prayer cloths available if you want to take that to someone. Uh, and if you can't make it up here, just try and wave one of us down and we'll come and see you. Let's pray for these requests. Lord, we thank you.
glad that I know the way maker. Yes, thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. We're going to get ready for this week's lesson. Uh, if you didn't receive a handout when you walked in, you can raise your hand and the ushers will be glad to bring you one. Uh, but this week, uh, the lesson is on our burden barrier, bearer. How many of you have a burden? How many of you have something that's weighing you down? We can go around and we can look at every face in here and probably name something everybody's struggling with right now. But in Psalms 55, 22, David wrote, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous, he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And it is very difficult for us a lot of times to say, I'm going through this situation, I'm worried, I'm stressed out about it, it's bogging me down, and just saying, you know what, there's nothing I can do, I'm going to give that to the Lord, I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to keep doing what I should be doing. That's hard for us, because... You know, you can get in the trap of, oh, well, this is, you know, so insignificant to what is going on here, or this is nothing compared to what this person's struggling with. The Lord has time for each and every one of us. He's not bound by seasons or by time. And so, regardless of what your situation is, Go ahead and cast that on him. Yeah. He's bigger than all of it. And th there's also a challenge uh, in this verse. So while, yes, we cast that burden on the Lord, uh, it is incumbent upon us that regardless of the circumstance that we're in, that we have to stay righteous. Yes. It says he won't allow the righteous to be moved. That means people can be moved. Yeah. But we have to continue doing what, whatever is right, yes. regardless of how we're being treated or how fair we think the situation we may be going through is. But I'm glad that we have somebody, because in this day and hour, there's too much going on that if I didn't have an outlet to cast that on the Lord, I don't know how I could bear it. Yes. Yes. And uh, I love him. I appreciate him that he's willing to take on that yoke and carry it with us. Lord bless you. As already been mentioned, good to have all of you here. Good to have the Gimples with us from North Carolina. And uh, they... Uh, brought Brother White, I guess. No. <clears throat> they, they heard he had been missing a lot of church recently. And uh, no, uh, I'm glad that he is feeling better and is able uh, to be here. We're thankful that all of you are. Uh, Brother Gimple will be ministering this morning, and uh, then he'll take the four-hour drive back to Coshocton when you go back. It's only uh, 45 minutes coming, but it's four hours going back when you, when you find the road. Uh, it, it goes through every big trail. And, no, it's not quite that bad, but almost, almost. Um, at choir tonight at 4 and a service at 5, and we are still taking up pop for the sweet corn uh, festival and Pepsi or Coke products are fine. Someone told me that Save a Lot on East Main has Pepsi products on sale. Um, <clears throat> Monday will be the Axe program. Tuesday, ladies prayer at nine and corporate prayer. This happens to be the last day of July. So August, uh, first Tuesday in August, we have corporate prayer at seven. 
led. Wednesday is Bible study, Thursday men's care group, and um, we have a back to school Sunday coming up uh, in a couple of weeks on August 21st and Brother Easter Revival in September. So a lot of things going on. I hope you'll be a part of. How many have seen the, the foyer floor and some of that? If you haven't, it's out there for your viewing pleasure. And I want to uh, thank all of you for <coughs> being uh, uh, giving and your faithfulness and because of that we're just uh, clicking along working our way through and uh, so many have worked so many hours doing from tearing out to building back to and we're not still done but uh, it looks a tremendous amount better and so we're we're thankful for uh, <coughs> what's going on we still have to give we still have expenses um, as a matter of fact, and I, I won't, I will not discuss uh, the person. It's it's rather uh, sacrosanct when people give. I don't um, like to, you know, uh, talk about givers. But we did have somebody who played the lottery, and they paid their ties, <laughs> and they won. Um, they didn't win seven figures, they didn't win six figures, and they didn't win five figures, or four, or three, or two, but no, sorry, they won one figure. Not one dollar, but they won one figure, and they paid their tithes on it, which was also one figure. So, hallelujah, you still have to give. And, and they told me, now pastor, I didn't ask you before I played, because I knew what you would tell me, but I knew that if I won, you would ask me for my ties. And so, <laughs> so I'm going ahead and pay. And I won't tell who it was, but remain anonymous. You can't go get a loan from them. <clears throat> but anyway, if, uh, if you win, and if you win five figures or six figures, don't hesitate to remember God, God's house. We can do a lot with it. <laughs> but uh, you know what? It's just what we've all done, work and hard work and, and uh, faithfulness. And I appreciate your faithfulness and consistency. And I uh, appreciate all of you that are here and all that have given and worked. May the Lord bless you. We're going to ask our ushers to receive our Sunday morning tithes, offering, building fund. And we thank you for giving faithful in your faithfulness. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We pray that you will bless every gift and giver. In Jesus' name, amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We always like to take some time and 
welcome some guests and just some that we've been missing. It's great to have uh, here with uh, sitting with the Glovers, Desmond, here friends with Draven. We're happy that he's able to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> welcome him. Also like to welcome Sister Shauna Blake, brought a friend, Emmanuel. We're happy that he's able to be in the house of the Lord. Bless him. Also, I saw Brother Shane Price. We're always happy when he's able to be here. Lord bless Brother Shane. We've been missing him. And Sister Amy Vishnawatha, we're happy she's able to be here. She's been sick, so we're so happy the Lord has touched her. And as Pastor already said, it's great to have Brother Gimple here from North Carolina. You speak Coshocton, but we're happy that he's able to be back and around here and brought Brother White. Thank you for that. Good to have him here. If you're a guest or a visitor and I missed you, I do apologize. We're so happy that you are here. And we do have a uh, gift bag we'd love to give you. If you'd meet me in the back of the sanctuary um, after service, we'd love to let you know more about our church and ways that you can get involved. We also have our first steps class. So if you'd like to know more um, about how you can be involved in ministry, let me know. We'd love to get you involved in that first steps class. If you would turn with me or if you'd put on the screen, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. This morning... During the worship, I, when we were singing, uh, I feel the chains falling. I, felt, I feel a breakthrough in the house this morning. I feel like the Lord wants to accomplish something this morning. Amen? And this verse says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his e eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he hath suffered a while, make you perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you. I believe God wants to perform a complete work. Amen? And the next verse says, uh, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Can we just begin to lift up that name of Jesus? Can we just say glory, glory, glory to God forever and ever and ever?
for being here in the house and I know we have some online and cannot be out and I, I want to thank all of you that uh, understand the importance of community and church and this part of your lives. I, I have seen, like all of you, a troubling uh, trend since COVID and the isolation and the individuals being isolated due to sickness and disease, and I get all of that. And uh, the very fact that um, almost uh, a lack of a willingness to uh, not just only come to church for myself, but to recognize that my presence can be an encouragement or a strength to someone else. And uh, because, you know, if it doesn't benefit me, I don't need to be there. If it doesn't help me, I don't. And that's sort of trend is, of course, a very self-centered, very selfish, and um, it's all about me. And, and then all of a sudden, well, you know, I can watch online and I can uh, surf, channel surf, and I can do all of that. And yet we have seen the impact of that disconnection within our young people. The suicide rate uh, for young people is higher than ever. Drug abuse, you can go through and name all of the things that are the have been increasing during these last two years. And the stress is there. I know, uh, you know, this past week, just, um, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan. Are we going to pick a fight with that, with China? And while we're trying to give arms to Ukraine and while we're trying to, you know, and you can go through, deal with inflation and not only inflation, but recession and not only recession, but people that won't acknowledge recession and, and the stress on uh, police officers. I saw where one town, the whole force walked out and, and quit. And uh, you say, what's going on? I, I believe that the world is heating up. And if the devil can isolate us from the strength that we get within the body and the strength from the church and the strength from God, and you say, well, I can touch God at home. Sure, but there's something about being in together says the more you see the day approaching the more we need to be in church and yet the trend is let's just have one service a week and then we'll do groups and fun groups and i get it and uh we were just in sydney and their church is uh doing well they have basically one service and and then during the week they break up and because of the size of the city and the groups all over town for all over for a variety of different reasons and trying to hold people even in if it's not to the main church but to a group of 10, 15 people and uh, keep connections. So uh, that, that trend is here. Uh, today, the Gimples are here and uh, brother and sister Gimple, sister Tracy, uh, been uh, working online for many years before online working was was cool and uh, but uh, they were a big help to me they were in Coshocton and doing well helping brother and sister white and involved there and we had a church in Marietta that um, lost the pastor and was in uh, major problems even at the time and still has not been able to recover fully, uh, but it is, I, I think, doing better than it was at the time because when it was a church almost in name only, when uh, uh, they were willing, I asked them if they would be willing because it would require him to work and it would put him about as far a drive as it was already from Coshocton over to the Cambridge area. Well, he could help in Marietta and drive to Cambridge, but it meant sacrifice, meant sacrifice for their family, and uh, yet they were willing. Brother Dillingham had a church later that 
kind of fell into the same situation that was he was connected to in uh, over in the Dayton area, and they were willing to go there. And then um, I got a call from the district superintendent of North Carolina, and the minister pastor there had died, and they were willing to go there. And so, you know, you say, well, being a pastor is wonderful because you never have problems. You never have situations. You never have stress. You know, it's only exacerbated as a pastor because what you're trying to do is hopefully try to be a blessing to somebody. No pastor that I have ever met goes into it thinking, I wonder how many people I can offend. This looks like a place where I could offend people, and yet you offend them all the time. And you, you know, sometimes if you don't do something, you offend. If you do something, you offend. If you preach too long, too short. The sad thing is, when people sometimes get offended at you, they take it out on God, as if God had some part in it. And it is a trick of the enemy for all of us because uh, could I get offended at all of you? Yeah, probably. If I knew something about all of you, I could be offended. Could I get offended at other ministers? Absolutely. Could I get offended at the organization? Without, that would be easy. Could I get offended at you, you know what? As a matter of fact, I don't have to drive very far down the street and I can find somebody to be offended at. They drive too fast, too slow. They took too long to turn. They didn't put on their blinker. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Before long, I could, but you know what it's doing to me? It's stopping the peace and the love and the presence of Almighty God because I'm carrying anger and frustration and bitterness because as far as I can tell there was only one person that walked in shoe leather that was perfect and even he offended folks in his perfection he offended now what am I saying about all that basically to say thank you brother and sister Gippo for being so willing to go to Marietta to leave family thank you for being able to go to Dayton and to North Carolina. We love you. We're praying for you. I don't know. I hope it's all going wonderful, but um, if it's anything like Newark, there's issues there as well as here. But we're glad you're here. Glad you brought brother and sister wife. And, uh, and glad your wife is here. Lord bless you. Come, minister. Thank you, brother. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Isn't it good to know Jesus? Praise God. If you'd stand with me this morning, it's such a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. And we're going to go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Amen. We so much appreciate this church and, of course, appreciate Brother and Sister Shostrand. They've been such an incredible blessing to our lives. And uh, I try to call Brother Shostrand not only when I need help, but just sometimes to say hi, because I think every time my name comes up on his phone, he's like, oh no, now what? <laughs> but I appreciate, Brother and Sister Shostrand, a blessing. Appreciate this church. I remember uh, back in the 80s, um, how many were alive in the 80s? Just want to make sure I got an audience, okay. Back in the 80s, I remember coming here and Brother Stone King used to preach a lot here, and we come and have some great times. And I'm thankful today that the same Holy Ghost that we felt there and felt then is still here today. Amen. This church, amen, what a testimony to the, to the long-standing power of God. Amen. Some churches come and go. Amen. They, they rise and they, they get something going, and it's for a season. But thank God this church is still strong today. And it's because of great leadership, serving a great God. Praise God. And we're so good to, so glad to be here. I want to greet you from sunny, hot, humid North Carolina. We thought Ohio was humid. North Carolina takes it to a whole new level. 
And uh, it was so wonderful today. I actually walked out of the house and my glasses did not fog up. It's the little things in life. For the first five minutes in North Carolina, when I walk out, I'm like this. I'm just like, you know, I can't see anything. But, uh, and that you were so nice to bring the cool weather. Um, we haven't seen 60s for, since February, I think. But uh, praise God. We were driving here today and my, the thing on my, on my car said 63. And I'm like, wow, it's like I should have brought a parka. <laughs> Blood's already thinning out. Amen. But we're so glad. God's blessing. Got a great church in Washington, North Carolina. And never dreamed or imagined we'd end up there, but God has ways of working, and uh, the Lord is blessing. We've got a great, great group of people. Uh, it's interesting, our area, there's a lot of Hispanics in our area, and about 40% of our church is Hispanic, and so we do pretty much everything bilingual. Uh, our visitor cards are English and Spanish, um, uh, a lot of things we do. And I preach through an interpreter every service. Uh, I have a couple young men that interpret. So if I pause... Every once in a while you're going, is he okay? <laughs> is something wrong? Um, I'm just, I've gotten used to, you know, so Brother Shoshan, if you'd like to break out into Spanish and start interpreting into Spanish, taco enchilada, yeah, that, that's close. <laughs> now then you'll make everybody hungry and they'll leave. But we have been blessed with a wonderful group of people. And you know, I'm so thankful this gospel is for everybody. Amen. And in our church, we've got quite a diverse group. But they love the Lord and they know how to worship God. And we're so excited to be a part of that and be, be their pastor. And so, so the wonderful thing about preaching out of state, I, I call these drive-by sermons. I come, I deliver, and I leave. I think it was, I think it was my, my wife's uh, grandmother used to, used to say we, when they were pastoring that they used to have um, ministers come through. They wanted to have a campaign. And she said, yeah, I know how that goes. They come and have camp and then we're stuck with the pain. So hopefully I won't leave any pain today, but I want to help you and minister to you today. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, a very familiar portion of scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read verses 4 through 7 and also verse 45. The Bible says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. You've probably never heard this story. It's a, it's a very uh, vague story in the Bible. Don't hear much about David, Goliath, but hopefully you'll... Uh, Catch on today. Um, Philistine by the name of, Gath, name of Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And to put that in our uh, modern day measuring technology, that'd be nine foot nine inches tall. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, or about 125 pounds. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And his staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. It was probably about two and a half inches thick, about five foot long. Spear's head weighed about 600 shekels, which would be about 15 pounds of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. Verse number 45 of the same chapter then said, David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. I want to preach to you just for a little while this morning on this thought. What are you measuring? What are you measuring? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for your greatness and kindness. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, for your excellent greatness. We pray, God, your anointing and blessing upon each one of us that we may receive your word. Lord, help us to draw closer to you, be encouraged in you today. And Lord, I pray for your anointing today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So after reading these verses in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we can come to a conclusion that Somebody was measuring. Somebody was taking some notes. Somebody was sizing up the enemy. Now, Brother Matthew, are you here? Ah, oh, there you are. Come. I didn't, I didn't see you before, so I couldn't warn you. But he's always a willing participant. Brother Matthew is probably one of the tallest guys I know. And he can't hurt me because I'm his brother-in-law and he loves me. So I want you to stand right here. Now, let me tell you a little story about Brother Matthew. We used to... We used to take Brother Matthew with us when we went to National Youth Congress. He thought it was because we loved him. No, it was because he was so tall. So what we would tell our kids was after service, everybody meet at Matthew. 
and that was our rallying point. So we would all, because he was like head, he was like the Saul of the National Youth Congress. He was head and shoulders above everybody. And so we would be able to point him out in the crowd and, and it worked. We'd all get together. All these other kids were wandering around trying to find their leaders and we all gathered at Matthew and we went out and ate and got to the restaurant first because everybody else was lost. But anyway, so Matthew, you're about six foot five, right? Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Take that state measure. We're going to run this to nine foot nine. Okay. I brought this tape measure. Everybody thought I was going to help them with the construction project. Uh, let's see. Where are we at? There's how tall how is that? Nine foot? Is that nine? There, eight foot? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Don't let, come on. Don't fail me now, man. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Tell me where we're at. We're about nine foot nine? Right there? All right. There's nine foot nine. That's pretty tall. If I saw somebody nine foot nine, I would be intimidated. Especially if he had a sword and he wanted to cut my head off. I'd be pretty intimidated. Thank you, Brother Matthew. That's pretty tall. But see, what happened was, is the children of Israel were sizing up Goliath and they were sizing up his weapons. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 11. The Bible says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So after looking at their enemy, measuring the size of their enemy, they came up with the conclusion that we are in trouble. Their conclusion was that caused them to become dismayed and greatly afraid. They didn't know Goliath as a person. They didn't know anything about him. They didn't know his parents. They didn't know his background. They didn't know his training. They didn't know anything about him other than the fact that he was nine foot nine. He carried a sword, a, a spear that's head was 15 pounds. He had an armor on him that weighed 125 pounds. And from just their observation, they determined that we're in trouble. They simply went by what their eyes saw, the measurements they took, and they said, we do not stand a chance. But this is what we need to understand today. Size is relative. Amen? Now, a human, an average human is about six foot tall, around 200 pounds, and that would be very large compared to a little ant, which may be weighing about five milligrams and maybe a, a quarter inch long. But a human is small compared to a blue whale, which can weigh in as 400,000 pounds and be up to 98 feet long. Does the human size change? No. What changes is what it's compared to. Compared to an ant, a human is huge. Compared to a blue whale, a human is small. How many ever read the story Gull Gulliver's Travels? Anybody here? Two people. All right. It's a good book. You ought to read it. It's about a man that, of course, by the name of Gulliver, who went on travels. And we find that in his travels, he made his way to a place called Lilliput. The strange thing about Lilliput was that all the people there, according to him, in his view, were six inches tall. He was a giant in Lilliput. They were, over, they were amazed at his size because everybody else was very tiny in comparison. But then we know that his travels continued on and he went to a place by the name of Brobdignag and there the people in his eyes were 72 foot tall. And so instead of being the tallest, now he was the smallest. But here's what we need to understand. His size never changed. Only what he was compared to. His size never changed. Only what it was compared to. You see, today our obstacles and our problems never change size. It's just a matter of what we're comparing them to. You see, Israel was comparing Goliath to themselves. And they said, to us, he is a giant. To us, he is bigger than us. He is stronger than us. And so we're going to be afraid because he's more than we can handle. But David came along with a different point of view. You see, David did not come with a tape measure. David did not walk out onto the field and say, hey, Goliath, come here. I need to get your measurements. 
I need to see how tall you are. I need to, I got my scale here. I want to weigh your, your shield and I want to weigh your spear and I want to weigh your sword and I want to see how much that weighs. And then from those measurements, uh, I will determine uh, my chance in battle against you. Uh, amen. You see, David was not concerned uh, how big Goliath was. David was not concerned how much Goliath's shield weighed or how much his sword weighed or how big his armament was. David was not impressed with Goliath's size. What David was impressed with was God's size. For David said, you come to me with a sword and it's a big sword. You come to me with a spear, a bigger spear than I've probably ever seen in my life. You come to me with a shield that for most men would be way too big or too heavy to carry. But I want you to know, Mr. Goliath, uh, hey man, I've got somebody uh, that in comparison to you, you are minuscule. Hey man, you are basically not even worth considering uh, because when I consider how big my God is uh, compared to you, you are nothing. Uh, that's why David uh, could walk out into that battlefield. Uh, hey man, the others were sinking in their, were, were hiding in their tents, cowering, even Saul the king. Amen was afraid because he was looking at the stature. But David said, hey, amen, let me at him. Let me at him. All, all I need is uh, my sling and a few smooth stones because I know how big my God is. So it doesn't really matter how big that David is. I'm here to tell you today, the devil will try to make your problems seem large. The devil will try to make them seem like they're overwhelming. And compared to you, they probably are. You might have situations today that are bigger than you. Uh, you might have problems today that are bigger than you uh, that you can't get over, that you can't get through, and you can't defeat. Uh, but I want somebody's point of view to change today and said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of comparing the size of my problems to myself uh, and to my own abilities. I'm going to start comparing the size of my problem to the size of my God. Amen. Is anybody here today impressed with the size of your God? You know, sometimes we ask people, how are you doing? Oh, going through it. Oh, I've got this problem and got that problem and this is going wrong and that's going wrong and, and I've got this and that and I don't know how I'm ever going to make it. Uh, and then we need to have the spirit of David that says, you know what? It doesn't matter how big my problem is because I know one thing. Uh, I know how big my God is. Uh, someone asked one time, how big is God? I'll tell you how big God is. Uh, amen. Uh, he's big enough. Uh, amen. Uh, whatever I need him to be, he is that and more. If I need to be a, him to be large, he's larger. If I need to be, have him to be big, he's bigger. Amen. He's bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any mountain. Amen. In fact, this is what David said. Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. O Lord, O Lord, how ex excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens... The work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visiteth him? He said, when I consider thy heavens. Have you ever thought about how big creation is? You know, we send up satellites, telescopes to try to see into the far reaches of the heavens. And sometimes man is pretty impressed with himself. Look at our technology. Look how far that we can see into space. Some of the pictures that are coming back are quite remarkable. But that's just the beginning of what God knows. For man has not even begun to comprehend the vastness of God. The Bible says in the beginning. What was, what was in the beginning? God. What was before God? God. God's always been and always will be. But in the beginning, God's began to speak the words. And out of nothing, he formed the universe. Out of nothing, he brought about everything that we know and see. That's the size and the kind of God that we serve. When I measure my problem to a God that said, let there be light. Think about that for a moment. There was no light. In fact, the sun and the moon, they weren't even created till the fourth day. 
The light was created. The Lord did not even need the sun. His light is far supersedes the light even of our sun. But on the first day, he said, let there be light. And the Bible says there was light. Out of nothing, God brought light. I don't know about you, but that's pretty impressive. And then he said, I'm going to form a world. And he began to form the world and he separated the, the seas and the land appeared. And then animals began to appear and he began to create them. And then of, all, of course, his crowning achievement was the creation of man all by a God who simply spoke it into existence. When we think about ourselves as being something, really all we are is nothing but glorified mud balls in the eyes of God. But he created us and made us. That's a pretty awesome God. Now, how big is your problem again? Hmm? I'm serving a God that stood on nothing and created everything. A God that spoke the worlds into existence. And you're there going, I don't know if God can get me through this. I've got this situation. David had a Goliath, but nowhere do we find David worried or concerned. You see, that's why David was able to run out into the battlefield because he was not even really looking at Goliath. Goliath did not impress him. Goliath did not scare him. Goliath did not intimidate him. He was just a shepherd boy, but he was a shepherd boy that knew God. He had a relationship with God. He knew about God. And he said, God, this uncircumcised Philistine is nothing compared to you. Isaiah chapter 66, verse number one. Thus saith the Lord. You want to know how big God is? The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me and where is this place of my rest? Think about it. Man wanted to build God a house. God's like, seriously? You can't big a big enough house. Oh, God, we want to we wanna build you a house where you can live. God says, good luck. Let me know how that works out for you. Because the heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. Oh, by the way, how big is your problem? What are you comparing your problem to? God says, you can build me a house if you want, but I want you to know. You can't big one, build one big enough. You can't even come close to what you need. The book of Numbers, chapter number 13, chapter 13 of Numbers. We read the story of the children of Israel getting ready to go into the promised land. And so they send the spies in. Now here's something we need to, need to know. The spies were not sent in. To determine the validity of God's promise. Amen. Those spies were not sent in. To determine the validity of God's promise. Because before they ever got there. God said it's your land. I promise it to you. You can just go in there and spy it out. And see what I gave you. It's like when you were a kid. And I'm sure no one here did this. But you woke up in the middle of the night before Christmas and you opened up the packages so carefully. When mom and dad were asleep and you peeked in. And then you tried to wrap it back up so no one could tell. And then act surprised the next morning like, oh, wow, just what I wanted. You see, you didn't get up that night to find it, to, to see if mom's, mom and dad's promise was valid. You say, well, I'm worried that these boxes are empty. So I better check and make sure they're not empty. Because you know mom and dad, they're not, they're not very faithful. And they may have not got us anything. We need to check. Amen. You know, you didn't need to check. That promise was there. So God didn't say, didn't say I, want these, I want these spies to go out to make sure it's okay. To make sure God knows what he's talking about. So they sent the spies in and 10 of them come back and say, can't do it. Oh, it's a wonderful place. Don't get me wrong. It's flowing with milk and honey. Just like the Lord said, it's an awesome place. But we're too small. 
because we saw some giants there and we saw some walled cities there. And in, in our viewpoint, there's no way that we could ever take that land. Now, wait a minute. God said it's yours. How many promises do we not get from God because we let the devil talk us out of them? How many promises does God say this is yours and we fail to capitalize on it because the devil intimidates us and we think, well, it can't be. I made too many mistakes. I messed up. God certainly can't. Bless me. But two of the men came back, Joshua and Caleb, said, we can do this. They, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't concerned about the size of the walls. They weren't concerned about the size of the giants. That was of no concern to them because they knew their God had made them a promise. And they knew that God had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And that same God that brought them through the Red Sea could certainly handle anything that they can. Let me, let me tell you this. God made you a promise that he's building you a mansion. His promise is that you're going to spend eternity with him someday. It's not God's will that anybody should perish, but that everybody should come to repentance. It is God's plan and purpose for you to be saved and for you to live on the streets of gold and live in glory with Jesus for eternity. That is his plan. And let me tell you this. There is nothing the devil can do, no matter how big he tries to appear, that he can thwart that plan, that he can sidetrack that plan. Amen. God's plan for you is for you to live in glory with him for eternity. And there is nothing the devil can do unless you decide in your mind that you can't make it that somewhere along the line that you say uh, it's too hard it's too hard the problems are too big come on somebody you understand what i'm saying oh i, I i'd love to make it to heaven but boy the lord doesn't even know what i'm going through Surely there, there's no way he could help me through this. How big is your God? Now watch this, verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people of Israel, the people, for they are stronger than we. How did they know that? I don't read anywhere where they had any arm wrestling competitions. I don't see anywhere where they went in and said, hey, uh, how about if we have a wrestling match to see who the strongest is here? They, they, they had no way to know how strong the enemy was. But they concluded in their mind, we can't go up because they are stronger than us. Now, I don't have time today, but what you need to do is you need to read about the story of, of the walls of Jericho. And remember when the, when the spies went in? And, and they, they hid in Rahab's house. You need to read what she said. You know what she told them? Listen to this. She said, we heard about you coming. Now, this was 40 years previous. These people had been walking around in the wilderness for 40. If you, I, I, did a, I did a Bible study one time on the journey of Israel through, through the wilderness. And they literally walked in circles. I wonder how many times in those 40 years somebody said, I think we've been here before. This kind of looks familiar. 40 years because of unbelief. But now we get, now, we, now we're 40 years in. They go into Jericho. They send the spies in. They're hiding up. And Rahab says, I want you guys to know that we heard about you guys when you came out of Egypt. And we were scared to death. Read it. It's in there. I'm not making this up. For 40 years, they were shaken in their sandals. When are they going to come? What's taking them so long? But these spies went in and they said, there's no way. Now, what they didn't realize is the people that they said are stronger than us were scared to death of them. It's in there. I'm not making this stuff up. For 40 years, they were fearful of Israel coming. And Israel shows up on the doorstep and says, 
We can't do it. We can't do it. They're too big. They're too strong. And those people they thought were too big and so strong were scared to death of them. Let me tell you here today, the devil is scared to death of you. Here's what, here's what the only hope that the Canaanites had was that the children of Israel did not realize how big their God was. If they keep God small, we got a chance. If they don't understand how this devil right now is talking to somebody saying, your God's not that big. Your God, because he's scared to death that you will understand how big your God is. And all of that stuff the devil tries to bring in your life, all those problems and trials that he tries to make seem so big. Amen. The devil knows all they are is a facade. Amen. He knows they're a paper tiger. He said he knows there's nothing to it. But if you ever realize how big your God is, the devil knows his days are, he's over. He's done. He's done. But here's what they said. We're not able to go up for they're stronger than we. Verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land which thou which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Now watch this. And all the people that we saw in are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we, watch this, and we were in our own sight. as grasshoppers and so we were in their sight see they saw themselves as a grasshopper and they assumed the enemy saw them the same they said we went there and we saw the giants the sons of Anak we saw how big they were we saw how walled their cities were and in our own sight our conclusion is that we are but grasshoppers. What a sad, sad conclusion. Because nowhere did these 10 men ever consider the size of God. They got, they got sidetracked. They got distracted by the things of the world. The size, the apparent size of their enemy. I'm not going to tell you today that the devil's not powerful. I'm not going to tell you that today, today the devil can't do anything. The devil can come across as pretty intimidating. This world can be pretty intimidating. Amen? Children of God, sometimes we feel very intimidated in this world. Sometimes we think... I don't know how we're going to reach this culture. I don't know how we're going to reach this generation. It seems like they're just too far gone. The enemy's too strong. And the church, it seems like we just kind of pull back and we pull in. Let's just tie a knot on the end of the rope and hang on till Jesus comes. But Jesus said, I'm going to have a church. And he said, that church, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against that church. My church, you know, we sing that old song, Oh, when the saints... Go marching in. Amen. Some of you are just hoping you get to crawl in. Some of you hope you just barely. I'm telling you what. This church is not going down. This church is going up. This church has taken the devil's best shot. Amen. The devil has done everything. Amen. That he can do to try to destroy this church. But I'm thankful today that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is still standing as strong today as it has ever been. And you know why? Because there's people that refuse to compare the themselves to the problems of this world but they've got their eyes on a God whose heaven is his throne and whose earth is his footstool and said you know what I will not be intimidated by the devil I will not be intimidated by the world because I know that no matter how big it seems my God is bigger does anybody thankful today that you've got a big God amen you need to put your tape measures away unless you're helping with the remodel You need to quit measuring your problems. Amen? 
You need to quit measuring the size of your problems compared to yourself. You need to put that old tape measure away and say, you know what, devil, you can make that problem as big as you want to make it. You can make that sickness as big as you want to make it. You can make that trial as big as you want to make it. But I want you to know you can't make it big enough to be bigger than my God. Because no matter how big you make it, my God is still bigger. My God is still able. And I don't care how far you might be in sin today. I don't care how far you are from God today. It doesn't matter how big the devil may seem to be in your life. I'm here to tell you there's a God who is bigger. Let's stand today. So here's the question. What are you measuring? What are you measuring? Did you come today looking at all those problems? Going, oh my goodness. That doctor's report, that's big. That bill we got in the mail, that's big. That diagnosis we got, that's big. That situation I got with my family, that's big. My kids aren't saved, that's big. My family's lost, that's big. But here's my question. How big's your God? Who are you comparing to? Are you amazed by the size of the problem? Are you amazed by the size of God? I wanted to choose today to be impressed with God's size. Devil, you can't make a problem big enough. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You can't make a problem. You can't make a sin deep enough that God's blood can't reach me. Come on, somebody. We need to change our point of view. We need to compare everything to God. Oh, I've got a problem, but my God's bigger. I got a situation, but my God's bigger. I got a need, but my God's bigger. I'm going through a storm, but I got the God that calms the storm. Come on, somebody. Jesus told the disciples, come on, guys, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything we're going to face on the way. So they get in the boat, and they're rowing across. Everything's good. And then all of a sudden, a storm comes up. Now, Peter and James and those guys, they were experienced fishermen. They had probably been through every storm you can imagine. But there was something about this storm that caused those experienced fishermen to say, we're going to die. We have never seen a storm this big. Oh, come on. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Right now. We have never seen a storm this big. I have never seen the wind blow so hard. I've never seen so much lightning crash in the sky. I've never heard the thunder roll like it's rolling now. Hey, man, the boat's filling up. We're going to die. This is the end because this is the biggest storm. But what they forgot was they had the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the back of the boat sleeping on a pillow. And they woke him up and said, hey, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? I would have loved it. Jesus gets up. Woo. What's the problem, guys? I hope this is good because that was a great nap. I don't know if Jesus dreamed or not, but he might say, man, that was the most awesome dream. I, and you guys woke me up right before I got to the end. I don't even know what happened. This better be good. And they're going like, look around. We're getting ready to die. And you're wiping sleep out of your eyes. Jesus says, oh, you're worried about this storm? Is that what's got you all bothered? Come on, somebody. I, I see the worry on your faces. Is it, is it this storm that's got you all out of fix? Yeah, Lord. It's ready to, it's ready to kill us. That's all. So he walks to the bow of the boat and kisses the bow. He says, ah, oh, that's it. This is easy. Peace be still. Any 
Anything else I can do for you guys? You guys need anything else? They're looking around going, whoa. And they probably start looking at each other. I really wasn't afraid. Were you afraid? Yeah, I wasn't afraid. Yeah, Peter Wright, I saw you. You were scared to death. No, I'm fine. I'm good. You see, we get in the middle of a storm and we think this is the one that's going to kill us. And Jesus is just waiting for you to call on him. He's right there in the boat. Come on, somebody. He's right there in the boat. You just got to say, Jesus. And he'll get done. He says, is that all you need? And you're going, wow. The Bible says they were amazed. <laughs> never seen it like this before he calmed the biggest storm we've ever seen in our life because you see that storm when Jesus spoke listen to this when Jesus said he only had to say one you know, you know Jesus only has to say one word he said Lazarus that's all he had to say he just threw the come forth just to make sure Lazarus knew what he wanted him to do you know why he called him by name? Because if Jesus would have just said, come forth, every grave in that whole graveyard would have been opened up and there have been dead people coming out from all over the place. But Jesus only had to say, he just got him and said, peace. That was it. I'm here to tell you, Jesus has got a word for somebody today. You ever hear somebody say, oh, if I just had a word from the Lord. That's all you need is a word from the Lord. We want a whole chapter, verse, a book, maybe even the whole Bible. Amen. Sometimes all you need is a word. Amen. As every hand is raised, eyes closed, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. We're going to sing, worship God. I want you to know God's got a word for you today. God's got a word for somebody today. He's going to be pre He's going to bring peace into the midst of your storm. Amen. He's going to bring healing into your life. He's going to bring deliverance. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. The Lord is in the house. what I want you to do. Everybody put your hands down. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. If you're looking around, you're cheating. Don't be a cheater. If you feel the Lord dealing with your heart right now and you need God to come put a, bring a word into your life, I want you to raise a hand right now. If you need the Lord to bring a word into your life right now, come on somebody. You need God to bring, I need a word from the Lord right now. There's hands going up all over. I need a word from the, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God's got a word. He's going to speak to somebody right now. I want you to get your hands raised saying, Lord, I receive it right now. Lord, speak. If you want to come, I, I, I just want to ask you. I know this is going to make you, you're going to have to be brave. If you got your hand up, I want you to come and walk down to the front of this church. I want you to walk down to this altar. If you really want to have a word from the Lord, come on. I know it's a long walk. It's about 14 miles, but you can do it. If you want to hear from the Lord right now, God, I need a word from the Lord right now. God's got a word for somebody right now in Jesus' name. You come up here, you raise your hands, and you say, Lord, I'll receive it. Lord, I believe it. God, I'm going to receive it right now in Jesus' name. Oh, I feel the Lord in this house. Somebody's going to get their word right now. God's going to bring a word into your life right now. I want you to raise your hands. Come on. Raise your hands. Say, Lord, I'm ready. I receive it, Lord. I'm not going to measure my problems compared to my size anymore, but I'm going to look at them relative to your size. Oh. 